Hey, uh, we have a guest with us uh, this morning. Uh, they were at the Kaiser campus at the Nine. So if you're here doing both services, it's kind of a little change up. Rob and Janelle Shipley are missionaries uh, connected with Church on the Hill and other churches, but they have been working. They've worked in Africa and Russia, and they are going to hear Sharon this morning with us uh, about some current events, but also, I trust, with the word of the Lord. You know, there's people in your life every once in a while that God puts in that uh, always leave you with something. They, when you're gone, when you're done, they've left you. And I believe that Rob and Janelle are going to leave us with something here this morning that we're going to walk out of here with that's precious. And so I would encourage you just to lean in to what God would have for us here, here today. So Rob, come on up, man. And we're going to pray. And yeah, would you welcome them as they come? And... Yeah. You don't need to worry about that. Yeah, pray with me, would you? Father, uh, we just want to pause and say uh, that you're the great arranger, like Carrie just read earlier. You're sovereign, so you knew who was going to be in this room this morning. You knew that Rob was going to be here at this particular time. And so at this intersection of circumstances and time and opportunity, we pray that we would hear carefully what the Lord has to say through his servant. We say, blessed is he. We bless you, he that comes in the name of the Lord. Yeah. And everybody said, amen. 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 Thank you. Bless you, man. Hello, everyone. It's, uh, it's really good to be with you in Turner. Um, my wife and I are from Oregon, and we left in 1999, but this uh, Oregon is our roots, and we come back and visit from time to time, and I've, I've made a decision that, that I think I want all our visits to be in August from now on. It's uh, beautiful, beautiful, and we haven't had a chance to do it, but at some point or another, I hope to encounter a blackberry bush. Uh, yeah. I... When I, when I was a kid, I tried fasting one time, and blue, black, blackberries were my undoing. I, didn't, I couldn't make it past the blackberry bush, and my fasting ended. <laughs> my wife and I love Bruce and Linda and the others on the staff here, and we're really grateful. And um, we, we really do just want God to speak to us. Bruce asked me, uh, have, you, have you met my wife, by the way? I should, I should introduce you. We've been married 43 years. Yeah, please stand. Her name is Janelle. Uh, Bruce asked me to, to give a little bit of, of perspective on what's happening. For the last 18 months, this war has been going on. Um, there are no official estimates, but the best estimates say that around 75,000 lives have been lost. Uh, different points during the conflict, of February, this last February would have been one of them, and, and the earlier part of the conflict, 1,000 lives a, a day were being lost. Uh, the numbers break out about like this, uh, of those of those thousand lives, um, 800 would be Russian lives, 200 would be Ukrainian lives, and all of them would have been created in the image of God and loved by God. Six million Ukrainians have been displaced. Um, no one knows how many Russians have left the country. Janelle and I have personal friends who emptied their savings and sold their furniture and their cars to get their sons out of the country to avoid their sons being conscripted. We don't know what the, the future holds. The, I, I do want you to, to know this, that your brothers and there, you have brothers and sisters in Christ. Oh, sorry, they told me to stay in this circle, in this square up here. I've been constrained. <laughs> what was I saying? <laughs> you have brothers and sisters in Christ on both sides of this tragedy. <clears throat> we don't know what the future holds for Russia. We don't know if, 
if reform will come, if a stronger strong man will replace Vladimir Putin, if the country will fragment, if there will be civil war. But here's what we do now. We know that change is coming. Vladimir Putin can't live forever. This war will not go on forever. And whatever comes, be it bad or be it good, whatever comes, God will be out in front of it and there will be spiritual opportunities for those who will seize them by faith. And uh, it's quite likely that some of you will be involved in that in some way or another. So that's what's happening in Russia, but the story doesn't begin, didn't begin in February of last year. I'd like to begin my story of Russia in 1885 in the city of Orenburg on the east side of the Ural Mountains, just a, just a short thousand miles from Siberia or so. A young man, a baby was born. We've come to know him as Ivan Voronayev. And some of you know his story well. I don't know his real name. Ivan Voronayev belongs to a man who died about 25 years after Ivan's birth and his identity was taken by Ivan to escape the country. Ivan was a young man, a soldier in the, in the Tsar's army, and he had an experience with Jesus Christ. And during that season of life, he came to these convictions that I can't bear arms against, uh, against others. I can't, I can't do that. He made his convictions known. He was threatened with court-martial, a very public trial, and the potential of execution. So he got his family out of the country to the United States. And... Uh, in 1912, he escaped to America through Turkmenistan and China, made his way working among Baptist churches in San Francisco and Seattle. 1917, he moved his family across the country to New York. His 18-year-old daughter went to church with their neighbors one evening, and while she was there, God filled her with the Holy Spirit, and she came home electrified with the presence of God. And, and Yvonne said, I, I, you know, pray for your papa that God will do in him what he did in you. For six months he was praying and then at some point in that time he was baptized in the Holy Spirit. He began meeting with others and, 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 uh, and, and at some point along the lines, God clearly spoke to him three times saying, go to Russia, Ivan, go to Russia, go to Russia, go to Russia. So he and this, some of this band of believers went back to what by this time had become the Soviet Union. They, they began their work in uh, Ukraine, Odessa, as I recall. They began the work in, 2000, in 1920, excuse me, by 1928 through their church planting and gathering of believers. There were 400 churches. I don't know how many believers. In 1930, the Soviet Union officials decided that this church thing was getting out of hand. They wanted to put a stop to it. The way to put a stop to it, they felt, was to gather up the leaders and uh, send them to the gulag, to Siberia, to the gulag. So 800 people, along with Ivan Voronayev, were loaded onto trains with no food and no water and shipped 2,000 miles to the east to, to Siberia. Eventually, Ivan's wife, Catherine, was also arrested Somehow she begged and pleaded, and, and un, this is quite unusual, but they allowed her to be in the same prison camp as her husband. She worked in the kitchen, and he did this hard, hard labor outside, but in the evenings they would walk together and pray together. 1935, uh, Catherine was released. In 1936, you know, occasionally a socialist have capitalist ideas. And uh, the socialist government decided, had a capitalist idea that they could appeal to the U.S. government and the churches in America to raise money. And if they raised enough money, they would release Yvonne. So churches, just like this church, they gave money. And true to their word, the 
Soviet leaders released Ivan Voronayev and then rearrested him. Catherine Katrina searched for her husband in the various camps, trying to keep track of where they had sent him. Their children were in the United States. In 1949, she, through letter, tried to reach their, their children, and her letter was intercepted by the Soviet officials, and she was rearrested. She was put in solitary confinement, slept on a concrete floor. They watched, the soldiers watched her through a peephole waiting for her to, to break. She never did. With the death of Stalin in 1953, she was released. And in 1960, the Eisenhower administration was able to secure her release to the United States to come and live with her children. She spent from that entire time through and up to 1960 and then until her death in 1965, she spent that time trying to find out if her husband was dead or alive. No one knew until records were opened after the collapse of the Soviet Union in the early 1990s that he had been executed in 1937, shortly after his arrest. The churches that he left behind, primarily in Ukraine, but also in some of the Stan republics that you would, you would know, The churches that he left behind, they were persecuted and, and, and even the children, they knew what it was like from eight, ten years old on, what it was like to have to stand up for their faith in, in a system that mocked them, that limited their opportunities, that persecuted them. So they had a pretty hardy faith. Well, when the Soviet Union collapsed in the early 90s, late 80s, early 90s, there was a group of, of, of young 20-somethings that had this vision that as soon as the door opened, they would go east to plant churches where their grandfather in the faith had died. So when the Soviet Union collapsed and the door was open, they went east. Those men are now around my age, some of them just a little bit younger and some a little bit older. And they're the bishops in, in Russia. And many of them, their families still live back in Ukraine. So as their, as their family members report the suffering that they're enduring with the shelling and the things that have happened in Ukraine, these pastors are in the untenable situation of having young men from their churches sent to fight in this war against the pastor's own family. I think it's difficult for us to, to fully comprehend or identify with what's going on among these people on both sides of the border, and certainly most acutely in Ukraine. These people multiplied their churches Today, they say there's somewhere between 3,000 and 4,000 churches. What could possibly, here we are in, in Salem, Oregon, no threat of attack, or at least not from outside. What could we possibly have in common? Each and every one of us, our stories intersect with the story I just told you because someone was sent. God sent Ivan Voronayev to the Soviet Union. And everybody is here because at some point or another, God sent someone to your family, to you, to your place of work. All of us. 
let me tell you about the person God sent to my family. Um, I hesitate. We, we always knew her by Sister Hovdi. Um, that's what we called people. Instead, we didn't know their, last, their first names. We just called them sister or brother. It was an old-fashioned thing we did, but I think it was actually kind of clarifying. But anyway, Sister Hovdi. Interesting, about the same time that, that Catherine Voronayev, a widow, was dying, God sent a widow to my family. You see, my story is that I'm the youngest of seven kids. In the mid-60s, my dad left, left my mother and the family. My mom was left by herself. Some of the older kids had went to the winds, but there were some of us younger ones, I'm the youngest, uh, were left. And there was this widow who lived in the town next to us, and God spoke to her. She didn't have a driver's license. She had to talk someone into giving her a ride. Didn't have a driver's license. She came and visited my mom. And she prayed with my mom. And she gave my mom some hope that the brokenness that characterized our family in that moment would not be our story forever. So I have a picture I want to show you. That's my oldest brother on the right. Um, his name is Ray. He texted this picture to me a year ago. And in that picture, he's 73 years old. You know why he's there? He's there to be baptized. Because God sent Sister Hovde to my house in the mid-1960s. I'd like you to turn in your Bibles. If you have a paper Bible, you have the luxury of being able to turn to two places at once. Maybe you guys, electronic people, can do that as well. I'm not sure, but if you have a paper Bible, turn to John 20 and, uh, and Mark 5. So here's what's happening. Uh, John has these words that he remembers from the mouth of Jesus and they become themes as he writes, as he writes this, uh, this gospel. And over and over again, he tells us that Jesus was sent. The Father sent Jesus. Jesus didn't just go. He was sent by the Father. So then let's see what happens. It's the resurrection. Jesus has died. He's gone to the cross. He's ra been raised from the dead. He appears to the, to the uh, disciples and here's what he says, verse 21. John chapter 20, verse 21. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I'm sending you. So here's, here's the picture we have. The Father sent Jesus. Jesus and the Father together send the Holy Spirit. And then the triune God Father, Son, and Holy Spirit turn to you and I, to the apostles, and say, I'm sending you. Now, what do you think of when you think of someone who is sent? Some of you will think of people like my wife and I and many others in this congregation that go overseas. We live in foreign lands. Well, I'd, I'd like to challenge that notion. I, first of all, let me agree. That, 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 that point is correct, but I'd like to challenge that notion, and that's where Mark 5 comes in. So turn to Mark 5. Okay, what's happening there is that Jesus has gone to the region called the Gerasenes. He's encountered this man who is stark raving mad. He's, he's out of control, completely isolated from family and community. He's violent, he's dangerous, he is, he is crazy, and he's filled with demonic powers that animate him physically and derange him mentally and socially. And uh, Jesus sets him free. <laughs> Wouldn't that, I, I mean, talk about a wonderful day for that guy, huh? Not only that, he restored his dignity. What the, the text tells us that when people came around and saw what Jesus has done, the man was clothed and in his right mind. Jesus gave him his mind back. 
and he was clothed. His dignity had been restored. And then, so what does he want? When just time to, the people kick Jesus out because Jesus, this is a little too far fetched for them. They've lost 2,000 pigs, you know, in this process. They, they just want to get rid of Jesus. Okay, it was nice, but now go away. And the man wants to go with Jesus. So we pick up the narrative in verse 18. So Mark 5, 18. I have to kind of tilt my Bible up so I can get it in the light here. As he was getting in the boat, as he is Jesus. The man who had been possessed by the demons begged him that he might go be with him. And Jesus did not permit him, but said to him, go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So in other words, those who are, 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 go to the nations, they're sent. But in this case, we have a man who, who is sent home. See, the, the reality is that we're all sent. We just need the Lord to help us. We need to learn how to live sent. And that, that's like a, a Copernicus revolution where I, I'm not just wandering, but I'm sent. I don't go to the barber. I'm sent to the barber. I didn't just end up married. I was sent to the joys and challenges and refining moments of marriage. I don't just go to a restaurant. I'm sent to a restaurant. I don't just have a work. I'm sent to work. It impacts everything. There's a huge difference between just wandering on your own and being sent. Before things were as dangerous as they are, moms used to send their kids to the grocery store. So I can remember being a little guy and my mom saying, go and get a gallon of milk. Now, there were two things that she said that, that I, I always remember. She said, she would always say this, and don't dilly-dally. <laughs> so in other words, you're, just, you're not going to wander around at this, in the store and look at the, look at the licorice and look at the pepperoni. No, you're going to go. And then she would say something else. She would say, hurry back. And so I remember thinking as a kid, so I can take my time going, but as long as I hurry back, it's, I'm okay. <laughs> but that remained unspoken because there was something else that mom didn't say that I added to everything she did say. It's just five simple words. If you want to live. So I, I remember carrying this gallon of milk. I'm just a, a little guy. And, carried, and it used to be that the handles came, were kind of just stuck on the top and they were designed to cut into people's hands. <laughs> and I remember carrying that. It was, I thought it was forever. It was only looking back, it was only a block and a quarter. But then when I was 12, I got a paper route and then I could go to the store without being sent and I could look at that licorice. Back in those days, they had these big licorice ropes that they just left them out for people to sneeze on and, <laughs> and they had pepperoni. And I, I, then, then I just wandered. Being sent has some constraints, some restraints. See, I can't buy... I, I can't be sent by Jesus online to devalue other people because they disagree with my political views or because they come from a different ethnic background or, or because they have a different level of education. But because I'm sent, there's so much I can do. And I love it. Janelle and I, several years ago, we were traveling through Oklahoma, central Oklahoma, and, and we'd been on the road a couple hours and needed some breakfast, stopped at, at a restaurant, and as, as we're being in the process of being seated, the Lord tells me something about our server and tells me something I'm supposed to say to her. 
She comes back and takes her order, and um, after she took our order, I said, um, you might think this is strange, but I feel God wants you to know this. And I spoke the word that the Lord had given to me. She burst into tears and walked away from the table, served our food without saying much. Then when she put our check on the, on the table, the bill on the table, she passed a note. And in that note, she told us what she was going through, why God had spoken to her, what it meant to her, what she would do about it. Sometimes living scent gives birth to obvious, wonderful things. 2011, God spoke to us about a nation in the Middle East, and, and it was a nation that Americans are not allowed to, to live in at all. And, and uh, so we knew we'd have to be outside the nation. We were looking at where, where, should we, where should we locate. It would have been much easier if we could have gotten in the nation, but we had to, where, where, where do we belong? We were praying through that, and we were in the process of researching and working and praying and trying to discern. And someone from this church sent us an email. They named a city, a city not far from the country of our focus, and they said, I believe God is about to do something in this city. I'm not telling you what to do. I'm not claiming divine authority or authority over you. I'm just submitting this to you very humbly. Well, we went to that city. We hadn't been there very many months, and a man asked to meet with me. I sat down with him, and he said, for six years, the nation you're trying to reach has been on my heart. But I've been alone and I've been praying, God, send someone here who will share my heart and will help me. Are you the ones God had sent? We began working together and then we, after God put us together, he began calling others, others, others. Over the next few years, somewhere near 100,000 scriptures, copies of the scriptures were distributed. I have no idea how many underground house churches exist in that country today, and this team is still going strong, perhaps stronger than ever. It was clear that God had sent us there. Sometimes being sent is painful. Janelle and I were called to a meeting week and a half ago in which someone that we, who we, we know, we love, we put a lot of effort into the relationship, into their, their work, and this person just railed against us, railed primarily against me. Uh, much of the accusation was based on misunderstanding or misinterpreting I had the, the same internal reaction that you would probably have. That, um, I don't deserve this. But the more I, time I had to pray about it, I realized that Jesus was with me there and that he was bearing these accusations. He was bearing... This anger he was bearing, this was his child. And that I had been sent there to bear it along with him. And then along with him also to bury it. Knowing that in his grace he will work in this person's life. Sometimes living sent conflicts with our desires and our perceived needs. I find it interesting in the great story of the feeding of the 5,000 it's preceded by these words. John the Baptist had been martyred, been killed, ingloriously beheaded. Jesus wants to get away to grieve. He wants some time with just people who love him, with the Father, he just wants to grieve. Gets in a boat and he's on his way. The crowd, sensing, seeing the boat, which way, the trajectory, the crowd runs around along shore, and when, the, and when he arrives, the crowd is there with their needs, their brokenness. 
And the scripture tells us that Jesus was moved with compassion. Living scent isn't always isn't always easy. It's not always convenient for us. Sometimes it costs us sleep. Sometimes it costs us reputation. Sometimes it costs us money. Almost always costs us time. Sometimes you don't know that you're sent. Such is the case January 5th. 2002. Janelle and I were home from Ethiopia because we needed to uh, renew our visas. And it was a Saturday, one of those gray winter Saturdays. And I was helping my mom. I didn't feel particularly sent. I was just helping mom do errands. She wasn't that great of a driver by then. And I'm just driving her around Portland doing errands. And it's getting toward the latter part of the afternoon. And I say, Mom, I, 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 I really want to get over across the river and see Dad. By this time, my dad's wife had passed away. He had Parkinson's disease. And he was in a nursing home in Vancouver. My parents' divorce had, uh, had never... Their relational difficulties had never been resolved. The bitterness had never been never been dealt with. Both of them had come to faith, but um, they avoided one another. And uh, in those, on those rare occasions that they did have to be together, um, you could feel the tension. None of us enjoyed it. It was not, it was not pleasant at all. So I said, Mom, I, I, I need to get across the river and see Dad. And, and she said, well, I've been, I've been thinking about going and seeing him. And I thought, wait. You know, in retrospect, I should have checked her for weapons. <laughs> um, but I I'd honestly, to my shame, uh, I... I I didn't take her serious. So I tried to get her home. But if you look on your calendars and, or look on, on, on the web and you look presidential visits to Portland, you'll find that there was a presidential visit and this George Bush was in Portland and the place he was speaking was Park Rose High School, which is pretty much between where I was with mom and her house where I needed to go to get her home, and it was impossible to get her home. So across the river we go. And I think, well, she'll probably just sit in the car. We pull up to the, to the nursing home, and Mom gets out of the car, and I thought, well, this will be interesting. She walked in front of me, and I'm sure I'm the one who knew where the room was, and I'm sure she didn't, but somehow or another we got to the room. She walked in the room in front of me, and I'll never forget it as long as I live. She walked up to my dad's bedside. Now, my dad had left her. My dad, granted, she had been full of bitterness, and their marriage wasn't good, but she, my dad walked up to her, my my mom, excuse me, walked up to my dad's bedside. She said, Ray, I'd like to ask you to forgive me because I wasn't the wife to you I should have been. I saw something I never thought I'd see. My parents reconciled. Not in marriage but as brother and sister in Christ. I didn't know I was sent that day, and, and the reality was the on, my only job was to drive and watch. I've come to the conviction since then that I was there for one reason, to bear witness so that someone would tell my siblings, do you know why mom is happy now? Do 
you know why her health is improved? Do you know why she doesn't guilt you into why you're not spending more time anymore? It's because she's free. God sent me to see something, to see Jesus at work, knowing that there would be times in the future when I would, be, when I would also be sent, knowing that one day I would be sent to church on the hill tell you what God has done in my family. And other days, many times, I'd be sent to an airplane seat next to someone whose family is broken and they have no hope. Living sent requires two things. First of all, God sends us. But then it's our choice. It's our choice whether we want to Submit, to see, to enjoy it, to embrace it. Matthew chapter 25 is um, one of my favorite chapters of the Bible, and that's, uh, that's counterintuitive because it's actually, a, it's actually a chapter about the judgment of God. Uh, I, if you don't like the word judgment, let's just cha- let's use the word evaluation. Jesus tells us there's, there's three ways we'll be evaluated, and, it's, and he tells all three of them to, through stories. First, he tells a story about a wedding and, and five wise bridesmaids, five foolish bridesmaids. And he, in the end, we realize that the, the, the basis of evaluation is, are you ready? Are you ready for the coming of Jesus? He said he was coming. Are you ready? Are you ready? The second story is about talents. Now, I'm not talking about the talents like those people who sing on TV, whatever those. I'm talking about a a talent that is a unit of money equivalent to 20 years wages uh, for a laborer. Okay? So the person who was given five talents to invest, we're talking about 100 years wages. Okay? Okay? And as you, as you finish that story, you realize what Jesus is saying is what you do with your life intentionally is important. Do you intentionally live in such a way like Danielle talked to us so that what we, what we have given ourselves to last, it has eternal value? Whether it be our resources, our time, our affections, all those things, our skills, Then the third story. Now, this one's my favorite. The reason I like it is because the good guys in the story are just as ignorant about what it was all about as the bad guys. And so it's about sheep and goats. And uh, the the nations are all lined up. All the people are lined up. and, And the judge says, okay, you guys, you're goats. You guys are sheep. And the, the, the sheep say, well, why are we sheep? And he says, because I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. I was naked and you clothed me. And the goats say, well, why are we goats? Well, because your character was different. I was thirsty and you you didn't care. I was hungry and you weren't willing to give. I was sick and you had no time for me. I was in prison and you didn't want a bad reputation to rub off onto you. So what does that look like in, in actuality? What is, that, what is that going to look like when it's no longer? So here's the way I picture it. If I'm inaccurate, God will forgive me and I hope you do as well. God says, Jessica, I imagine there's a Jessica in here somewhere. Come on up here. Jessica, do you remember April 24th, 2023, Panera in Kaiser? Uh, No. 
Sorry, Lord, I, I, I don't remember. Well, you glance just to the left and you notice that the woman sitting at the table, you notice the tear trickle down her left eye. You fought with it because you didn't want to be intrusive, but eventually you got up from your seat. You sat down. You gave her your time. You listened to her story. You prayed with me, her and you shared me with her. Do you, do you remember? Sorry, Lord, I, 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 I'm not remembering. And he says, well, I do. We're not talking about the fact that the, these deeds, we know these deeds aren't what save us. But what, what Jesus is saying is that how you intentionally invest your life for the kingdom is important. But so are those deeds that I sent your way, that I sent you into, in which you treated people with a character that came out of your life and who have, I've created you to be exactly with the ease and comfort and the unremembered acts, just like, just like wool growing out of the back of a sheep. See, all of us, all of us, all the time, are sent. There's a haunting question. Perhaps it's not politic for me to even ask it. But consider this. What if Sister Hubby had never come? What if it what, what if it had just been a little bit too much of a hassle to call somebody to beg a ride so that she could travel four miles to our house? And what if Vornayev had said, you know what? God can use me in America. I know he's clearly directed me to the Soviet Union, but it's not a good situation there. and I can just stay here. Some of you are sent to the nations, to the 42% of the world that has no access to the gospel, no church, most of them never having met a Christian, some of them not even having a Bible in their language, 3.5 billion people. If you're sent, then you need to do what you need to do to get there, to follow him. So what about the rest of us? You're sent too. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that we don't have to figure this all out. But we do want to willingly, joyfully be your sent ones. And we're just grateful that in your mercy and in your kingdom, that long after those mansions and shacks and flip phones and iPhones and Teslas and blue cars are in a junkyard. The fruit of our sentness will continue to multiply because this is your kingdom. This is yours. And we are your people.
So we embrace being sent. We don't resist you in it. Help us to see. To not wander, but to see as you're sent once. And to obey as your servants, your sons and your daughters. In Jesus' name, amen.